Bill, uh, without giving too much away, give us uh, an idea of the impetus behind the book uh, Freezing Order. Uh, well, so Freezing Order is the sequel to my first book, which is called Red Notice. Uh, it's all about um, my struggles with the uh, Putin regime. Uh, Red Notice was was about the murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, and the, getting the Magnitsky Act passed, which is a piece of legislation which freezes the assets and bans the visas of human rights violators. And Red Notice is all about uh, the investigation that I and my team conducted into who got the stolen $230 million that Sergei Magnitsky uncovered and exposed um, and was killed over. And we conducted a, a big um, decade long money laundering investigation and discovered that Vladimir Putin got some of that money. So now the uh, Magnitsky Act was passed in the US in 2012 and 2017 in Canada. Give us an idea if this is the act that is being used today to impose sanctions uh, given Russia's uh, war on Ukraine, uh, I guess about six weeks ago, or are countries able to impose sanctions outside of the act? So the Magnitsky Act, the, the, the premise of the Magnitsky Act is that people commit terrible atrocities in their home country like Russia, um, and then they keep the money that they've accumulated, their fortunes, in the West. And so the idea was, and this had never been done before, which is, uh, is to freeze those assets in the West because that's where their Achilles heel. That became the Magnitsky Act. The Magnitsky Act was the first time this was ever done. Uh, Vladimir Putin went crazy when the Magnitsky Act was originally passed in the United States. He made it his largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act because he knew that at some point in the future, he was gonna do something so heinous that it was gonna be used to come after his money. And effectively, that's what's happened in the last six weeks. Now, the Magnitsky Act the, it technically is not being used. It's being, uh, there's probably a different uh, government name for it, but the Magnitsky Act was the template that is now being used to sanction oligarchs and corrupt officials all over the world. Let's uh, just get into uh, some of the uh, aspects of what you had just mentioned. What is an oligarch? Can you define that term for us? Well, an oligarch is a, is kind of a term that that emerged. I mean, it emerged from from ancient Greek society, which was uh, uh, a person with a lot of money and a lot of power. But the the it it, it came out more most recently um, in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union, when when a group a small group of individuals ended up having almost all the money of the country, and this is now Russia, um, and that money was then being used in all sorts of nefarious for all, all sorts of nefarious purposes. So the oligarchs are now, in my estimation, about 118 individuals. They surround Vladimir Putin, and Vladimir Putin um, uses them uh, for a lot of different purposes, but the main one he uses them for is to hold his own fortune. I estimate his fortune to be about $200 billion. And when you look at oligarchs and their net worth, uh, their fortunes are probably half of what's stated in Forbes magazine because the other half belongs to Vladimir Putin. Let's uh, talk about the uh, effectiveness of the uh, sanctions that countries around the world have imposed on uh, Russia. Give us some real world examples where sanctions have worked. And uh, then let's talk about the uh, sanctions imposed on Russian individuals, uh, businesses and uh, commodities. Well, so sanctions um, is a very broad term. There's a lot of different types of sanctions being applied right now. Um, uh, and what I would compare sanctions to would be medicine. So uh, it all depends when you use medicine, what, what, where your condition is when you use the medicine. So sanctions are highly effective um, as a general concept, particularly these targeted sanctions when used against Putin and his oligarchs. And we know that from their shrill reaction um, after the Magnitsky Act was passed, and we know that from different times in the past when sanctions have been used. Now, if sanctions had been used, if the Magnitsky Act or something similar had been used before the invasion of Crimea, of, uh, of sorry, of Ukraine, um, it would have had a very different effect than sanctions being applied after the invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin didn't think that the West would have the fortitude in the stomach 
and the cohesion to work together to impose these sanctions. Had we just sanctioned five oligarchs before the invasion of Ukraine, as he was aligning his troops, he might not have uh, done the same calculation as he did without that. And so now we're in a point when we, we've rolled out sanctions against the Central Bank of Russia, we've sanctioned Russian banks so they can't use the SWIFT international payment system, and we've sanctioned about 12 of the largest Russian oligarchs. But I don't believe any of these at this point are going to alter Putin's calculus. I think the purpose of sanctions at this point is to prevent him from having money to continue his war. If we can bleed him economically so that he eventually runs out of money for this war, that has to be the purpose of sanctions now. Bill, um, your thoughts on the uh, most recent images coming out of the uh, war in Ukraine? Um, a heartbreak just total and absolute heartbreak. When I watch these images, I feel sick to my stomach. I, I, I have a hard time looking at the pictures. I have a hard time reading the stories. And I completely understand um, what, what the people of Ukraine are feeling because I know Vladimir Putin. I know what he's like. I've been in, in a conflict with him for last 10 years. He doesn't ever back down. He doesn't ever show mercy. He doesn't ever show restraint. Um, various people connected to me have been killed and I know what they must be feeling right now. And, and the scariest thing and the most upsetting thing is that what we've seen so far is only a small, a small taste of what's to come. Vladimir Putin is completely and absolutely the most evil man in, who exists in the world today. And he's got terrible, terrible things in store for us going forward. What is the role, you had mentioned the West, what is the role now of the US of Canada? Well, the role of the US, the role of Canada, the role of the EU, UK, Japan, Switzerland, is to create a total economic blockade of Russia and Vladimir Putin. That has to be our only objective. We have to stop all money flowing to Russia. And what that means practically is that we need to sanction more oligarchs because they hold Putin's money. We need to finish off um, disconnecting all of the Russian banks from the SWIFT system, not just the 70% of the banks so far. And that means, uh, particularly for our European allies, to stop buying Russian oil and gas. So we're not sending Vladimir Putin between half a billion and a billion dollars a day to fund his war to kill Ukrainian civilians. Bill, what do you think is happening in Russia right now? Uh, happening economically, politically? What does that look like? Economically, it's a disaster. Um, I think that they're facing what will be the equivalent of the Great Depression for them uh, in due course because of these sanctions. The, the central bank has half of its reserves frozen. There's no more money flowing in from the oligarchs. There's no more money flowing in from Western businesses who have also cut out. You can't use your credit cards. You can't watch Netflix. You can't buy most products. It's going to be very painful for the average person. Having said that, Vladimir Putin has disconnected all truth from the uh, system. Nobody in Russia really knows what's going on. What they believe in Russia is that, is that the Russian army is on a special operation, a special humanitarian operation, is how it's being presented, to stop Nazis from committing human rights abuses in Ukraine. And the average Russian person doesn't know any different because all of the other sources of information have been shut down. There is no independent source of information. It's effectively like North Korea. And so the Russian people um, are in, in most, for the most part, supporting Vladimir Putin as he commits these atrocities because they have no idea that they're being committed. Why do you continue to tell this story? I started this telling the story when my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky was murdered. He was murdered for uncovering a massive government corruption scheme. And he was, wouldn't have been murdered if he hadn't been my lawyer. And so it's been my duty to him and his memory and to his family to go after the people who killed him, which is Vladimir Putin and his regime since then. It's been 12 years and I carry on. And as I carry on, I see more and more terrible things as we're witnessing right now. And I can't back away. I have to do more. And that's why I'm doing this. Tell us about the uh, risks when it comes to telling this story. Uh... Alexei Navalny comes to mind. 
Well, they um, have threatened me with death. They've threatened me with kidnapping. They've tried to have me arrested eight times through Interpol. Um, Vladimir Putin would like to have me sitting in a prison cell. Um, uh, I, I've, I've been sentenced to 18 years in absentia in Russian prison. Um, it's a dangerous place for me. It's a dangerous place. I, I would be killed if I was in a Russian prison. Alexei Navalny, of course, we know they tried to kill him with Novichok. But for, for, for me and for him, it's nothing compared to what's going on in Ukraine right now. What's going on in Ukraine is just unbelievable. It's just heartbreaking. It's just so cruel. It's unimaginable. And this is happening to millions and millions of people. And so whatever risks I face, it's nothing compared to what's happening in Ukraine on a daily basis. And I just, my heart goes out to the, every person in Ukraine who's subject to this cruelty. Thank you.